It's not the first strike of uh, the Macron presidency, but nearly one year in, it's certainly the biggest. Skeletal or non-existent train service in most parts of France this Tuesday to kick off rolling strike days that are scheduled through June. There were also uh, stoppages at Air France, uh, sanitation workers and more. Now the demands differ, turnout varies, but there is a common call, blowback against reform. You might think this country is playing to stereotypes. We'll be asking our panel whether under a young new president who spurned mainstream parties, times have indeed changed in France, or whether Macron is about to get a schooling. More broadly, will his reforms help or hurt ordinary citizens who picked Macron over the populist far right last May? Is he offering them an op opportunity or on the sly embracing a gig economy that's been brutal for both wages and steady jobs? Today in the France 24 debate, uh, we're looking at uh, the uh, first big test when it comes to strikes since Emmanuel Macron became president. Uh, with us, Olga Givernet, French Member of Parliament for Emmanuel Macron's La République En Marche Party. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Uh, welcome as well to Rémi Offrère Privel, Secretary General of the Rail Workers Branch of the CFDT Trade Union Confederation. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. You're on strike today. Yeah, well, of course. <laughs> and uh, from Brussels, Nicholas Vineker, who's the editor at uh, politico.eu. Nice to see you, Nicholas. Good to be here. And uh, let's say hello as well to Lex Paulson, who uh, campaigned for Macron and who teaches rhetoric at uh, the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po. Thanks for being with us. Good to be back. The uh, France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, the hashtag F24 debate. Now, uh, support, by the way, for this strike has grown over uh, the last uh, few days, up uh, four points to 46%. Uh, uh, that's according to a, uh, an opinion survey published by uh, the uh, uh, polling institute IFOP last uh, Sunday. Uh, the strike uh, uh, meaning that uh, more than seven out of ten uh, train drivers walked off the job uh, this Tuesday. We're expecting more of the same on Wednesday. Uh, facing the RAF on strike day, well, the French Prime Minister, Edouard Philippe, before Parliament earlier, warning that the 14 billion euros shelled out each year by the state to prop up the National Rail Service, the SNCF, well, they make the status quo untenable. This reform doesn't aim to privatize the SNCF. It isn't an attempt to shut down smaller lines. It isn't an attempt to scrap the status of rail workers. But it is an attempt to end this status quo so that in tomorrow's competitive rail climate, the SNCF can be efficient, competitive, and can continue to bring a quality of service to all of its users. Yeah, and of course, looming uh, through all of that, Rémi Offrère Privel, is uh, this opening up of uh, the, the, rail, the rail sector to competition. Uh, to, that's uh, the EU that is ordering it in the next uh, couple of years. Do you take the prime minister's point that the state can't forever be shelling out the equivalent yeah. of 14 billion a year? Yeah, according to us, uh, the status quo is unintendable. And he's right. But in fact, they begin the refor his reform without putting the right questions on the table. That's why now we are on strike. And the right question is how much, how many money we, you, you could put on the table to, to have the good services, the good railway services. And in fact, the French government have decided uh, two red lines that it's not acceptable for the French unions. The first one is the modification of the public uh, SNCF group to transform the group uh, not in uh, not in really uh, with public shareholding, but more private. private. And the second thing is to uh, destroy uh, the French statues of the re uh, French railways workers of the SNCF yeah. to stop. Uh, the recruiting to recruiting uh, young workers as the same statues. And in fact, the, the yeah, there would be just to explain, there would be a grandfather clause for those that are already uh, employed by the company. But younger workers coming in wouldn't get uh, the uh, wouldn't get the same. same status, which includes for rail drivers. 
retirement at age 52 in some instances. No, but not now it's impossible to, to get his retirement age at 52. Then it's more 53, 55. Like me, it's more 58, 59. And now you must work more like all, um, like all uh, French workers. That, uh, there's a, a sort of uh, manipulation in the media, in the, in the TV and the newspaper. Uh, it's very changing now for French railways workers, not, not only because of the statues, but uh, in face of realities. We are very in face of realities and we want to negotiate. In fact, uh, this reform is not, uh, is not so good because the start was bad. We are going, uh, we, we discuss, but we don't negotiate really. All right, uh, so a wrong-headed way to start uh, the negotiations, Olga Givernet? Oh, I, I don't think so. I think we have a process. We are today uh, setting up the future of the railway. And um, this is a two-month-long uh, negotiation process, which means that we start with the ordinance, meaning that we have the frame, actually, and all the outlines that needs to be discussed. And then uh, all the negotiation can carry on uh, to, to uh, end up with a law in, uh, in June. And this is a process we want to offer. And it's really appropriate with what we are facing at this stage because it's, it's a huge um, work to, to do. Uh, we have been talking about, about the change in uh, the SNCF for ages, for, for years. I'm 36 and I think I... I've always heard about the SNCF, and today we definitely need to improve uh, our services. So uh, th this process includes all the partners uh, from uh, from uh, the unions to to talk to. But you us. heard you heard Remy that for his red lines, there's changing the status to this being the same equivalent of a of a private corporation, and also uh, changing the status of workers. The, the status of, um, uh, we did equity, uh, and it has been part of the program of Emmanuel Macron months, months ago, uh, to say that now we, we need equity with every worker to have access to the same rights uh, as um, retirement and things. And we, need, uh, we think that jobs um, and professional careers are evolving, so we need to fit to the new uh, needs of this uh, new, new way of working. Nicholas Vineker, uh, the uh, strikes taking place again across many sectors, uh, public servants, sanitation workers, um, the pilots at Air France want more money. Uh, in this strike, though, the one at the national rail carrier, that's the one that matters, it seems. Well, this is uh, one of the most entrenched interest groups in, in French society with uh, a great ability to disrupt and disturb the, the sort of daily life of, of uh, millions of French people. And they're a very tough nut to crack. And, and there's a reason they've been able to hold on to what some may call privileges uh, for decades and, and no government has, has gone after them. Um, it, Macron has proved uh, exceptionally skillful in, in uh, negotiating certain reforms before this, but I think this pro process is turning out to look very different uh, from, from the other ones. Um, remember that there was a big labor reform in uh, at the end of the summer, at the fall last, uh, last year, that went surprisingly smoothly. Um, and the distinction here is that there were closed-door negotiations going on for months before the substance of that reform was unveiled. So all the unions, whether they were for it or against it, knew exactly what was happening. In this case, you have strikes that are going on as the negotiations continue. And one of the groups has decided to strike, or s several of them, to strike before negotiations have even started. So this is a very different type of conflict, and it's unprecedented for this president. And will he have to back down? Well, the, the conditions are very different. If you have a disturbance that continues for weeks upon weeks, uh, that disturbs people, people's daily lives, um, the one thing you have to keep an eye on is where is public opinion. And the uh, statistics that you cited before suggest that there's a very slim majority in favor of the reform. What can happen here? If uh, the disturbances are very serious, if they drag on for weeks and weeks, if the unions remain unified, then 
public opinion could switch and be ma majorly against the reform, in which case Macron would have a real issue on his hand and he would have to uh, examine the reform and see if it's worth it politically to go through with this thing as it was first uh, conceived. The National Rail Company steeped in history, its name uh, the SNCF associated with, well, the French resistance, uh, TGV High Speed Service, which is uh, the industrial pride of this nation since the 1980s. But also, as we were mentioning, a daunting debt pile, the fears of closure of more of the smaller lines, delays, major upgrades that are needed. And again, that pressure to compete uh, to, uh, to open up to competition. Thomas Waterhouse has more. It's long been viewed as a treasure of the French state and one of the world's biggest transport groups. The national rail operator, the SNCF, was officially set up back in 1938. Since then, it's grown and been expanded, and now 14 million people jump on board one of the company's trains worldwide every day, with 5 million passengers using one of the 15,000 services operated daily in France alone. The company runs a host of trains ranging from TGVs to local Transilien services, as well as the cross-channel Eurostar service, Thales trains to Brussels and Amsterdam, and the low-cost WeGo network. It manages 30,000 kilometres of track in total in France, 2,600 kilometres of which are high speed. SNCF is by and large still rated as one of the best rail operators in Europe in terms of speed, comfort, punctuality and price. It has a good track record when it comes to safety and it's had lots to celebrate in its 80-year history. A French TGV currently holds the world speed record for a commercial service set back in 2007. The company lists over 180,000 employees on its payroll in 120 countries around the world, with 12,000 additional staff members hired in France last year. Many rail workers, known as cheminots, have historic rights, including a job for life and the right to retire in their 50s. That's a decade earlier than other public sector workers. But the track ahead looks rocky. Turnover last year might have risen from the previous year to stand at 33 billion euros, but the government says the SNCF urgently needs a radical overhaul. The company is riddled with a massive 46.6 billion euros in net debt. That's a figure which rose a further 1.7 billion euros last year. Thanks, Paulson. Uh, when you look at this, and uh, you teach sometimes the abstracts, right, of politics in, in your courses, here is the, the it, this rail company embodies the very notion of French public service. Mm. Is that French public service going to be uh, guaranteed in the future? Let's not forget, for instance, that um, passengers, when they ride one of those trains, they're not paying the full ticket price. The state is picking up a part of that tab. It's true. And, and I think that the Macron government's been very clear that even opening up to competition does not mean privatization, that the quality of, uh, of, of train service is a public service that can be provided um, by private actors. And in fact, that if there is competition in the market, that this will not threaten the, uh, the privileges of the cheminot. They'll be guaranteed to keep their job, even if they have to uh, be transferred to a, new, uh, to a new contract. And all of the existing privileges will be kept. The question is, uh, as Remy said, will public opinion uh, stay on uh, the side of the government or, or shift, toward, uh, shift toward the strikers? But this is not 1938, where strikes were a bilateral negotiation to get management at the table and labor unions were the only legitimate voice of the workers. This is a complicated uh, economic uh, question that touches four million Million French citizens a day, and uh, the unions, quite frankly, are no longer the only voice in this debate. The government did a two-month-long consultation last fall, where 26,000 people expressed themselves online, 600 ateliers, uh, a, a consultation. So uh, it's a it's a three-dimensional game of chess now, no longer a two-dimensional game. And and uh, and frankly, I think uh, public opinion uh, uh, may, in fact, uh, you saw the 53 percent who were in favor of the reform, 72 percent uh, believe that no matter matter what the strikers did, the government was going to keep the reform. So it shows that the resolve of the government is holding. But you heard Nicholas Vinokur, the longer the strike continues, the more public opinion 
could turn, and that's been the case in the past against the government. It's absolutely it's absolutely a possibility, and and no one really knows uh, based on this, the the scale of this strike uh, how much frustration will will build and where it's going to be directed. But I will say this: um, in comparison, again, to past strikes which were designed to bring management to the table, the government's at the table. You know, the minister says every day, we are, in, we are open to negotiation, we're open to ideas. Uh, those who are at the table call them discussions instead of negotiations. Fine, but I think the government is showing to the French public its good faith uh, in the fact that it's listening, it's talking, it's, it's having this dialogue. Whether they can continue to convince the public uh, so that the public uh, uh, you know, gives them credit for that, stance uh, is another question. Uh, before we go to the break, Rémi Offrère Privel, uh, the head of your trade union confederation, says he's open to negotiations with the government. Some of the other trade unions seem more hard line over this one. Why is that? Uh, that's uh, that's the, 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 the pluralism. That's the, the, the varsity, diversity of the unionism in France. You have left side, you have you have middle size, you have all the kind of uh, unionism. And uh, some people in European countries, in you know, other France, uh, uh, doesn't really understand this kind of uh, unionism. But in fact, we have the same uh, point of view uh, to keep the French SNCF in the public sector and even to keep in this kind of public uh, status with public shareholding, because we are very afraid uh, to sell in uh, like in apartments some part of the French SNCF. And that's clearly uh, uh, the problem in this case. And the public status of SNCF, it's a balance between rights and constraints. Because if we organize uh, uh, the job, hard job, in 35 hours per week, we can't make any railway services. And then it's not a very treasury. Her statues, it's not a real gift because her, her statues uh, was not only from uh, 20s, but uh, it's uh, always change, always change. The status... And then we need, we need to build a good compromise. But in fact, it was the very worst beginning for the discussion. For worst beginning. When we come back, we'll ask how uh, it's going to work when it, we look at Europe and how the opening up to competition how France will fare. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. Uh, it's been a uh, Black Tuesday, say some commuters uh, after here in France, uh, more than 70 percent of uh, rail drivers walked off the job the first day of uh, many of strikes, say those unions, as they negotiate over uh, the reforms to the rail ser service in this country. And it's the biggest uh, challenge yet uh, from the labor movement to France's new president, Emmanuel Macron. With us to talk about it, Olga Giverny, who hails uh, from Macron's La République en Marche Party, member of parliament. Thank you for being with us again. Thanks as well to Rémi Offrère Privel, Secretary General of the Rail Workers Branch of the CFDT Trade Union Confederation. Lex Paulson, uh, who teaches at uh, the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po, and uh, from Brussels, and uh, Politico.eu editor Nicolas Vinegar. Welcome uh, back. Uh, just before the break, Olga Giverny, uh, we were laying the premise of... Uh, uh, why they were on strike. We talked about uh, the fact that uh, public opinion is of, uh, always in this country. There is sympathy for, for people when they, when they walk off the job. But let's get to the, to the point here. With that opening up of competition to the rest of Europe, does France have to play by Brussels' rules on this one? I think it's uh, it's a need now to uh, opening up to a competition and and to to be fair, um, the opening up of competition for SNCF is not it's not the first time. Uh, you know, in regional council, it's already opened up for all the uh, uh, lines, the, the small lines, um, and SNCF have been doing all his uh, its best to uh, to be in the competition. Now it's national. I think uh, they can do it. They can do it with a better services. We talk about rail, railway men, um, about their work. Uh, they they work out with shifts and uh, lots of work. They have shifts also, um, uh, so they can accommodate. So I don't think it's a problem for us to. Uh, 
um, do an evolution of this uh, company to ma make it competitive uh, on the market and have for the commuters, because today it's the commuters who want a, a better services that we need to focus on. The opening up to competition, uh, that's something, if you've been in a, co in a company that's had a certain corporate culture, and in this case it's a state-run institution, the SNCF, that's going to scare a lot of people. Is It is a, seen as a threat to them. Yeah, it, it could seem, be seen a, as a threat. I understand it's always changes. It's difficult. You you see the, the new political changes we are doing. Um, today we want a new culture. We want a debate culture, not a stride culture. We want to open negotiation and we are ready to, uh, to definitely uh, discuss with everyone and get all your good opinion and have a better a better a collective intelligence. This is the way we want to uh, to work all together. Uh, but today it's it's not the case. We don't really understand. Uh, the government doesn't understand, and and we at the uh, uh, Assembly Nationale, as a member of Parliament, we don't understand how how come there's this wall, uh, and we we can't go ahead with a dis with discussion. Rémi Offrère, Pébel. Uh, you know, competition in Europe uh, uh, could be worse for the uh, ticket price. For example, you, when you see in UK and in Germany, uh, the ticket price uh, is higher than before uh, competition, uh, concurrence. And then we must be very careful about uh, concurrence. Of course, the French Union are not uh, very agree for concurrence. But in, now competition. It's, no, no, no competition. Now it's becoming uh, an historical and uh, uh, a fact, a political fact that we can refuse. But but we don't we don't like that, of course. But we need to improve. We need to to be more efficient uh, for the the new uh, for the new era. And there is this one counterexample that has sort of haunted the debate. It's been more than two decades since British Rail was privatized. It's often cited in this country. Uh, and just to compare, France 24's Haxi Myers Belkin, well, she caught the train to London. Living by the sea, but working in London, an arrangement too good to resist for many Brits. Brighton and Hove is just an hour away from the capital by train, but there's a catch. Commuters here are at the mercy of a line they describe as nightmarish. This is my season ticket. Um, it costs just over £4,000, which is about 8% of my salary. And it gets me between Hove and London Victoria, so it doesn't even let me travel around the rest of London. Seats, meanwhile, are hard to come by, if that is the service is running. The line's been affected by some 40 strikes in just over two years. That aside from near daily delays. I've hired people who live along this line who actually can't afford to come to work anymore or who are you know, so stressed that they just don't want to work in London. When the state privatised UK railways in the 1990s, it said free market competition would mean better service at lower prices. But today British trains are the second most expensive in Europe after Switzerland and 60% of voters want the railways to return to state control. Before privatisation, back in the 1970s and 80s, growing up in Manchester, we had um, National Rail, and I do remember that it was very punctual, and I just remember it being very cheap. These trains are making so much money, and part of the money could be ploughed back into improving the services. Another contentious issue, the fact that 25 years after state-owned British Rail ceased to exist, many companies in charge of Britain's trains aren't even British. Most of the train operators, and there's about 20 different franchises, are run by foreign state-owned companies. So SNCF is involved, Deutsche Bahn is involved. So we have a very odd situation where uh, all these foreign state-owned companies are running our services, but a British government company would not be allowed to do so. Train operators turned down our requests for interviews directing us instead to a group which defends the UK rail franchising system. It's a, a myth that these profits are all being routed to shareholders and they are their enormous profits. Also, the franchisees take a lot of risk in taking the um, franchises on. They're not guaranteed a profit. In compliance with EU directives, France is preparing to open up its railways to competition. The government insists the SNCF will remain a public company. But French rail unions look across the channel and worry that privatization isn't so far off. Okay, Givernet, can you 
promise us that France won't go the way of Britain? I do promise there's no privatization uh, plan for this, um, for, for this company. We definitely want to change the status of the company, but it's still public funds. And uh, we have... Why, why the need to change the status? Be because today we have a, a, a huge debt. It's like more than 50 billion uh, euro. And, and we need to have a status that doesn't allow now to have this, this type of debt. The, uh, the states can't cannot support this anymore. So um, the status will help, the, the change to the company will help to, be, to make better um, financial working for this company. Nicholas Vineker, uh, seen from Brussels, uh, the uh, argument over the opening up of rail to competition, what has it meant for the, 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 the street cred, if you will, of the EU? I, it, I think we, we need to put this entire reform process in the European context. And um, we have a president who uh, wants to France to be credible again, wants France to hold to its commitments. Uh, he's doing that on the deficit side. He's doing that on, different, on, on all sorts of different questions, and including this one. Uh, is France going to play by the rules in terms of uh, opening certain markets to, to competition? Uh, I think that this is another uh, statement of goodwill to the European Union, that France uh, is not going to seek some sort of exception uh, on, on, on this directive. It's going to behave like all other European states, big and small. Um, the one exception, though, and, and as your report uh, so aptly showed, um, not all sectors are created equal. And, and the rail sector happens to be one sector where most people think it's a terrible idea to introduce even partial privatization, just like the, the public health sector. And I do understand the arguments that say this is not privatization. But what you're effectively saying is we're going to introduce a dose, a measure of competition into this sector. Wh and why that's this push? Why that this push to really to sticks in the ear? Why this push to always want to introduce competition in something that's considered here as a public service? Well, there you're getting into uh, EU, EU doctrine and EU antitrust doctrine. Um, and, and there's certainly an argument to be had about that. Um, does, does there need to be competition in every single sector? Well, uh, a lot of states would say no, but the European Commission under Margaret Vestager has taken a very expansive view of, of uh, competition and, and what's needed. Um, and uh, for them, uh, there needs to be lots of competition in markets. And nobody complained, for example, when you, when you have competition in the telecom sector. So we have cheaper cell phone deals than anywhere else in the world in Europe. But people do complain if you apply competition rules to public health, to public rail, to things like that. We think, well, the state should be in charge. Um, and it's hard to accept that, is this just a debt reduction measure? If that were the case, well, maybe people would accept it more. Or is it something else? Or are we letting in uh, 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 private companies and, and uh, a division of, of, of labor into the rail sector? Lex Paulson, before becoming president, Emmanuel Macron was the economy minister. And this Tuesday, uh, people in some instances to uh, get to where they need to go have been riding on what the French call les car Macron, Macron buses, yeah. the, the Macron buses, because when he was economy minister, he instituted these, uh, these sort of uh, this bus service, which is kind of a competition as well for the rail for the for, for the rail service, does that undermine the SNCF? These car Macron, these Macron buses. I think the sense of the Macron bus reform, as I as I understood it, was to promote accessibility uh, in part, the parts of France that are least connected to the transport network. And I think you know, three years on from that reform, um, they've broadly achieved the the, the objectives. What's in, what what was interesting is that each time, from the Loi à Comri uh, to the Labour uh, Ordinance of last fall uh, to now, the most 
pro-strike, the most radical element within the labor movement, which is a CGT, has been on the avant-garde proposing the grève and then each time has had to acknowledge a defeat. The CGT, which was half of all railway workers at uh, the time of the last major rail strike in 1995, is only now one third. So I think there's, there's an argument that this is some union politics as well. The more radical pro-strike elements, the ones least likely to try to negotiate a solution with the government, are trying to prove their relevance to their fellow workers at arguably the expense of the, of the French uh, transport using public. Uh, Rémi Offrère Privel, does that mean France has gone from a country of class struggle as it's sometimes portrayed around the world to one that's more reformist? No, 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 we don't think so. You can open the market. We are against concurrence, but in fact, you can uh, open the market without changing the essence of public statutes. Uh, in, 2000, uh, in 2014, the European Commission have totally accepted the three public enterprises in the SNCF group. And why you won't now change the statutes only four years after the law? That's completely crazy. Because uh, if, of course, union doesn't accept competition, but if you decide to open the market, you don't have any obligation to change the SNCF public statutes. And if you keep these public statutes, you can obtain a better loan interest. That's crazy. Some people say, like you say uh, just some minutes before, that it's better to uh, put private statutes in the French SNCF, even, of course, if you say as, as a guarantee, OK, we don't open the capital of the future of the SNCF. But in fact, that's completely uh, in contradiction of the basic economic law. Oh, it seems like the, what the government is promising when it comes to this change of the status of the company uh, is different from what Brussels intends. I think uh, what the government thinks is try to make a, a, a good deal with what we think inside and what we have as a culture um, and, and make sense also for, for Brussels. We talk about competition, we talk about Car Macron, and uh, there's also carpooling. Yesterday I came uh, from home to Paris, uh, carpooling. So there's already a competition uh, for the uh, railway. Um, so we need, we need to have it. We need to have it to be strong enough uh, to have a good public service. We need to um, have a good uh, web on the, on, in France um, to, to offer this possibility to, um, to people. And uh, we also had uh, some, uh, some event to talk about uh, around mobility. Uh, so we have expectation from the population to offer a wide range of services um, to different price. We're not trying to find the, the best prices ever. We just try to find a, a good solution, either carpooling or Macron's car or the railway or even uh, flying. And is France changing? Uh... Fr France is changing. It's changing slowly, but we, we can't see uh, good, um, good chances to, to, to do it. But as, as you say, we need, we need to discuss. You, you mentioned some, some arguments, and they are good arguments. So we, we need to find the better deal, the better balance for everyone to, to improve. We, we're not going to change everything in a year, we, but we need to go in the, in the right uh, way, look forward. Yeah, and this, this brings us to the question of uh, what are the fault lines here in politics? And the case of uh, these strikes are really illustrate that uh, when it comes to the SNCF, about the notion of public service. And I've heard people complain saying, yeah, Macron said that he would take the best ideas from the left and the best ideas from the right. And what have we got so far, a government where they only take the ideas from one side, the right? Well, look, I mean, there are lots of ideas that have come from from the left, the progressive left, whether it's education reform and putting more money into priority school districts, whether it's uh, investing more in, in renewable energy, whether it's uh, a very progressive uh, approach toward uh, towards the refugee situation. So, I mean, I think and not to mention the, the rights of women and the, the incredible. But strides. if he backs down on this, 
Are we just going to go back to the classic left versus right divide that we had before? It's a big danger, Francois. I mean, you ask, you ask the right question. I mean, the fact that there is such a constituency in the center for reform, people are sick of hearing the same solutions proposed and the same uh, strikes and the same manifestation. They're ready for something new. Uh, I think uh, Macron has shown that he's willing to give this new approach uh, a serious try for five years, and, and we'll see what happens after that. Nicholas Vinokur uh, will... Uh Macron's uh, pilching of uh, uh, support from both the big center left and center right blocks, is that going to be a one off? Could this strike be a turning point in that sense that we maybe see a return to that old left right divide? I think that the position in the center is by definition an unstable one. You're uh, constantly pulling either to the right or either to the left, uh, as, as the issues dictates. Uh, on this one, uh, as you said, it's, it's an uncomfortable exposure for uh, Macron. It's one where he can uh, easily be caught in the minority um, with a big kind of center-left group, uh, and even some people on the right uh, advocating for, for the status quo. Um, I don't think that he is... Um, going to alienate the, the right, though, on this particular issue. If you look at what the, the conservative mainstream is, is saying in France right now, uh, it's, a, it's a very l economically liberal message that they're, uh, that they're promoting with, with Laurent Vauquier, who uh, calls for much, much tougher uh, policies. There's one thing that should be uh, recalled, is that Macron is not taking an ax to uh, the, the public sector as a whole. Uh, France has one of, you know, uh, 56 or 57 percent of its GDP is devoted to, to pu is, is public spending. And he's doing very incremental changes on that front. So I wouldn't like to present this president as some kind of uh, Thatcher-like figure. That's not the case. He's uh, conducting targeted specific reforms in some areas, and, and it's very hard, tough going. Mm -hmm. Very tough going. I want to thank you, Nicholas Vinegar, for joining us uh, from Brussels. I want to thank Olga Givernet. We'll see how, how these uh, strikes unfold as well. Rémi Offrère Privel, Lex Paulson. Stay with us, please. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to uh, Emma James. Hi there. Yes, been taking a look at how this one's playing out online. Uh, lots and lots of reactions, as you might expect. A lot of international reactions, too. But starting off here in France, uh, the cartoonist Plantu has uh, come up with his interpretation of today's events. La galère can mean the galley of a ship, but it also means uh, big trouble, big pain, basically. Um, and it says no trains, but uh, there are possibilities, i.e. cramming yourself onto uh, uh, <laughs> some sort of boat on the uh, River Seine there to get around Paris. Um, this is another cartoonist offering, Na, who's likened this to Wild, you know, the movie where she does the epic trek right. uh, and calls it a survival course and it says uh, I must travel 14 kilometres in a hostile environment and you can see all of the uh, cancelled trains there up on the board. Um, there are of course many more strikes to come. Lots of people uh, publishing images like this showing the number of days in the next three months where we are going to be affected by strikes. Some of it SNCF, some of it Air France uh, and obviously other organisations getting involved in it too, uh, which is why it poses such a big problem for Emmanuel Macron. Um, what we're seeing are a lot of tweets like this one. I don't like strikes. I hate arriving at work late. I hate getting home late. Uh, but I've got to always be um, in solidarity with, with people who are fighting for having their rights respected. Um, it's interesting to see that there is so much support out there that a collection, an online collection is being made. More than €115,000 has already been raised. Now, that money will be given to those people who are on strike, who will have their pay cut as a result and who maybe can't afford to live with that uh, pay cut. So that money will be shared out. As a British subject in France, does this surprise you? 
Uh, a little bit, yes. I mean, <laughs> all strikes tend to surprise me because it is quite a rarity, especially in this day and age. Obviously, uh, in, in years gone by, we saw a few more strikes in the UK. But, but right now, um, really, the idea of a strike in the UK is very, very unusual. Um, taking a look at this in terms of more general um, reactions to it, uh, the Journal de Dimanche had um, some interesting st statistics uh, from a survey saying that 46 percent of French people actually feel that this strike is justified. However, slightly more nuanced than that, because a lot of people, for them, it was qualified support. Only 15 percent said it was completely justified. Um, the other interesting figure is 72 percent um, think that the strike action won't actually make any difference, that the, the government will get to do what it wants to do no matter what. And it really is seen as a huge test for Emmanuel Macron on this one. Yeah, and just on that, Lex Paulson, here, here 72% think, think Macron will go all the way. So if he bends, does he then lose all his luster? Absolutely. This is, a, this is a man who believes in momentum for reform. And this is, it might not be the reform that's the easiest to explain uh, in 45 minutes on TV, but it's certainly one that could uh, tarnish his brand. And lots of people... Um also, Emmanuel Macron will be pleased to see uh, the use of a hashtag. I don't support the strike of the railway it's a long workers. Hashtag. It is a very long hashtag. Because now it's more than 140 characters. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's just as well. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to say anything else. Uh, this woman saying that uh, the freedom of some stops where others uh, begins. And this gentleman saying that he's just seen images from uh, train stations and um, train carriages where they're completely uh, cr overcrowded. And he calls it a, an absolute absolute disgrace. Uh, now, one of the images that has been being spread far and wide is this one from the Gare de Lyon, uh, where a woman actually fell onto the tracks. Um, there was kind of chaotic scenes, really, there, where people were trying to cross uh, to a different platform because one of the few trains running was coming, mm. and she ended up uh, in that position there, saved by passers-by. I've also seen images of a, a baby being passed through a train window. Now, they're very narrow at the top, mm. um, but people are so desperate to get on board the few trains that are running, uh, that they seem to be taking all manner of risks. Um, now, Le Point is among those uh, that has drawn a, a line, a, a comparison, if you will, to Margaret Thatcher, going back to those strikes of the 1980s in the United Kingdom, um, saying that him arm wrestling with the unions is akin to Margaret Thatcher when she faced off against the coal miners in the 1980s. Um, whether it will be quite uh, as devastating to his reputation as that was for Margaret Thatcher, well, we'll have to wait and see. Um, it's also interesting to note that people on both sides of the political divide are talking about this one. Pauline Bock, a French journalist who's based in the UK, says uh, that it is both sides, some saying they don't want the French rail to become like the British one, which is, of course, privatised and hugely expensive. Lots of debates online, interestingly. Some people swearing blind that French trains are more expensive than the UK. I can absolutely promise you they are not. <laughs> um, but uh, La, France, <laughs> La France Insoumise, the left-wing party, says that uh, when everything is private, uh, we are deprived of everything. And they don't seem to care that Emmanuel Macron isn't talking about privatising uh, the rail network. Um, interesting point here that uh, Emmanuel Macron last month actually he talked about his own grandfather who had worked on the railway lines um, and he was saying to a railway worker look the the situation has changed. You know, the rights where you get to retire early, it's changed now. People aren't shoveling coal anymore. This, this is a much easier time of it. And maybe some of these rights should be looked at again. You know, things do have to change mm. depending on, uh, on the times and, and the situations that people are in. Uh, just one last word on this one. Lots of foreigners getting very annoyed. You can't just cancel a train going between two countries five minutes before <laughs> it's due. Uh, and this woman, a Canadian, says these SNCF strikes are dumb. This is why Capital people Z. hate the French. Oh, oh, dear. <laughs> A little harsh, perhaps. Oh, all right. Well, thanks. <laughs> no, she's welcome. She's welcome. Thanks for that. Emma James Smith, thanks. Well, I still thank... want to be private. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate. It's true.